I would like to say that uh, I'm going to present uh, today some work on the Lansing reconstruction and uh, integrated sex wolf measurement from the Planck data. And this work is obviously not mine, but the result of a dedicated group of individuals that have worked very hard to get you this wonderful and fantastic data. So I hope I'll, I'll do them honor. Um, that being said, uh, we've seen a lot of time today the uh, Planck uh, CMB map, and I want to start with some very different maps. Uh, actually, if I need to uh, summarize my talk in two slides, it's going to be this slide and the next slide. And those two slides are going to be uh, maps of the large scale structures as seen by Splunk. So Planck not only see the large scale structure at the uh, last scattering surface, but it is also sen uh, sensitive to the uh, large scale structures through the weak lensing effect. And this is what I'm showing you right now, uh, which is a reconstruction of the distribution of matter in the universe at redshift about two that we, that we can extract from the Planck CMB data. This is a 25 sigma detection. It's pretty amazing. It's a full sky map of the large scale structure at this time. The second map, actually there are two of them, uh, which are pretty amazing as well, are reconstruction of the uh, ISW, integrated sex wolf effect. So those ones are a bit more difficult to get by, and there are only a 2.5 sigma detection, and indeed it's not a full reconstruction, it's only the cross correlation, it's a common mode between the CMB temperature map and external traces of the large scale structure. And the interesting thing here is that while this one use the uh, NVSS survey as the external tracer. This one use the uh, CMB lensing map that I just presented you before. So this thing essentially is our best reconstruction of the integrated sex wolf effect, best map of the integrated sex wolf effect that we can get using Planck data alone. So I'll present and discuss these two maps, how we get by them, what we can do with them, uh, and how good they are. And I'll spend obviously more time on the lensing map, since it's the one which is uh, measured with the, the best uh, <coughs> signal to noise. So CMB lensing, so you all know that uh, the lensing effect is a deflection of photon path in the uh, large scale structure uh, gravitational wells. This is actually a remapping of the uh, observed temperature and isotropy, and this remapping goes at the uh, gradient of the uh, lensing potential, which is the map I just showed you, showed you before. This effect is small, so it's only a 2.5 arc minute effect, which is actually coherent on degree scale, which is why you can see something, which is why we can measure it. So you want to do a <coughs> Taylor expansion of it, and immediately when you do Taylor expansion of it, you see that what we're measuring in the temperature is an isotropy is a mix between the primordial temperature and its gradient, and this mix goes with the gradient of the uh, lensing potential. So immediately you know what you want to do if you want to measure the, uh, <coughs> the lensing effect, so you want to do all of that, which is uh, quite a lot. You just want to do a quadratic estimator, and it all boils down to that. So you take two temperature maps, you inverse variant filter them, you differentiate one, you filter it by the temperature power spectrum, you do product of the two, I, I forgot the filter here, and there you go, you get, uh, you get, your, um, you get an estimate, a normalized estimate or of the uh, lensing map, and that's what we're doing. Well, not exactly, actually, because this is going to work in a perfect experiment with uh, uh, no mask, no galaxy, no anything, and we have all of that. We have mask, we have an, uh, inhomogeneous noise, and we have beam ellipticity, all of that are breaking statistical isotropy of the map which translate into a huge response in the quadratic lensing estimator, which is shown here. The dashed line is what we're looking for, and these lines here as a response of these three things here to a quadratic estimator. And this is biasing at the map, uh, this is biasing the map. But the good part of it is that, well, you can measure that on average by doing Monte Carlo, and you can correct for that on average, and that's what, that's what we're doing, actually. So I have to amend this thing. If you want to have your lensing map, and the lensing map I've just showed you is just that. You do this thing. Well, you don't, don't forget the, uh, the, the CL filtering. I forgot. <laughs> you do that. You compute the average bias on the map level. You correct for it. And there you go. And that's what you get on, on the simulation. So this is an input phi map. 
And this is what we can recover in a very plank like simulation. It's pretty close one to the other. And this is actually a Wiener filter map. But you can still see some, some stuff. The, this thing must be noisy. And indeed, it is noisy. So that's the signal we're looking for again. And those lines are, are different noise level depending on what data we're going to use. And the black one is almost the best we can do, we can do with Planck. So we get lots of noise here, which is, well, you know it, so that's fine for the map. But that's going to be an issue for the power spectrum because, obviously, once you get the map, you want to go to the Lensing power spectrum that was presented by, uh, by George before, and you want to do some cosmology with it. So you need to debias for this noise. But the, the good news here is that most of those bias, you know them. You just have to compute them exquisitely, exquisitely so that you can debias for them. So that's essentially the equation. I'll go through the different bias that you need to, uh, need to compute. The first one, which is dominant one, actually, is a response of a Gaussian map to your estimator. It's non-zero. It's dominating. It's what's causing most of this... Uh, most of this signal here. You can compute it analytically in a perfect case, but of course we're not in a perfect case, so we end up doing it using Monte Carlo, and it's working very well. The next part here, well, actually, it's a higher order effect. When we're building our estimator, we stop the Taylor expansion to the first order in five, but there are other orders. So those other orders contribute. Actually, there is some lensing information here, but we're leaving it on the table with the estimator we built. So we have to account for it, and it comes into a small bias at, at, um, at small scales that we can estimate using, uh, using analytical approximative, uh, approximate formula which still have some error, and we are accounting for the uncertainty in the final error, uh, er error uh, we are assigning to the uh, measurement of the power spectrum. The next one, well, it's a tri-spectrum the, from the point sources. So we're masking, of course, the resolved point sources, but we still have a lot of point sources that we, we can see. You have this diffuse component and resolved point sources, and this one has a tri-spectrum. The good news is that you can compute in a very simple model the, uh, the shape of this tri-spectrum, and you can estimate its amplitude, so you can Again, correct for that. Of course, there will be some uncertainty, and we're folding this uncertainty back into the uh, or error budget. And finally, there is this so-called Monte Carlo bias, which is whatever remains. We are doing lots of approximation. What we're doing, I mean, we can write all of the equations. We cannot compute all of them, so we need to do some uh, some approximations. They are explained in great detail in the paper. Uh, I advise you to read it. And, and we still have to correct for a few things that are related to the way we treat mass and things like that. So we don't really know whether those extra bias are multiplicative or additive, but since they are at a percent level and we're test checking that on simulation, we can deal with them using a lens Monte Carlo this time and we're getting something which is of very high quality. So once you get all of that, well, you know what you need to do to uh, measure the uh, lensing effect in the, the Planck data, but I still have to give you another uh, point of information, which is uh, what data we're going to use. So obviously we use lots of different data, and this is in the end our best reconstruction. It's not the absolute best. We can do better than that. But it's the best in the sense that it uh, leaves us margin on each side, being more aggressive, less aggressive, to check the validity of this particular data. And this is a product we're using. So what we've been using is a minimum variance combination between the 143 and the 217 GHz HFI map. We're correcting for dust using the 857 GHz uh, map as a template. And there's a good reason for that, which I explained in the paper. Uh, we are further masking the central galactic region using a 30% galactic mask. Uh, we're including a uh, mask for C, uh, carbon monoxide uh, contaminated region, which is quite important for us. Uh, and also masking, of course, uh, the resolved point sources to give in a signal to noise. We're further apodizing this mask to 5 degrees to, uh, to have a nice transition between the mask region and the mask region at the power spectrum level. This is quite important, again, to have a lower bias. Uh, and all in all, we end up with a reconstruction for the power spectrum, which is used an eff uh, effective uh, sky fraction of 67%. And this, was, uh, this is what you get. So this is our CMB lensing reconstruction, was shown here, oops, sorry, is a minimum variance result, the one I just presented you, compared to the 100 gigahertz data, the 143 gigahertz data, and the 217 gigahertz data. 
and you can clearly see that you have a very nice agreement and you have uh, we actually have art figures uh, showing you how good this agreement is in the paper and I you know, invite you to read it but if you need to take away something that we have a very good agreement here we are only using the 143 and 217 data set here not even the 100 gears which is uh, an extra 10 sigma determination of uh, the lensing uh, amplitude and we're not using that now we're doing a lot of robustness tests here so I, I'm not going to describe all, all those, uh, those things essentially testing for foreground uh, contamination by changing the mask changing the, uh, the data set and uh, Laurence Perotto in a few days will tell you what we can do with uh, compound separation maps here as a comparison. Uh, we're changing the uh, point sources mask, well, changing a, a bit of everything. We're also testing a result using different algorithms, different filters, different set of approximation. All of that are in very good agreement. So it's a pretty robust uh, uh, determination. And we can also compare our result to uh, other survey. And of course, oops the uh, SPT and ACT result. And you can clearly see here, while well, we are in reasonable agreement, uh, of course, SPT is already better than us at, uh, at small scales, so it's never going uh, to be the case at, uh, at large scale. So in the future, we'll have a nice complementarity between Planck at the larger scale and the full sky and some small spots, which will be refined using uh, ground-based data. So now that we have this uh, pretty determination, we can try to do some cosmology with it. And uh, when we are fitting for cosmology, we're not going to use the full range of data. Again, we want to have margin to check things. And actually, we're going to use only the cleanest part of the data, which is between uh, L equal 40, L equal 400. There are reasons for that. First of it is that, well, the significance of our determination, the bulk of it actually lies between uh, 40 and, and 400. Well, by, by Picking this, uh, this range, we're leaving five sigma here and five sigma here. It's about, uh, about the same thing. And the second reason is that, well, the larger scales here can be polluted by a wrong uh, or slightly wrong uh, by a map, uh, map bias correction, which has a min those mean fields I showed you before. And the smaller scales, well, it's, it's uh, the power spectrum bias that I showed you before, which also depend on the, on the simulation. So it's, it's Pretty better. Uh, it's pretty good to to use only this this part of the data. Here I'm showing you the improvement uh, brought by uh, adding lensing to the uh, Planck data. Uh, so using this mean region here, or adding the low bin and the high bin. What what you should get from it is that lensing uh, marginally improves uh, the, the six parameter um, lambda CDM constraint by about 20 percent on a, on a few parameters. Uh, adding the high bin and low bin doesn't change this improvement as expected. It shifts a little bit some of the values when you're adding this thing here, which can be polluted by, by systematics that we're not accounting for. So this brings, uh, gives us another reason not to use this data for now. Cosmology. So <coughs> Paolo already uh, described this result, so I'll go quickly through it. We can use lensing to build, to improve a little bit the um, determination of tau using Planck data alone. Actually, lensing already <laughs> gives us some, uh, some determination of tau using only the uh, temperature likelihood, because the temperature likelihood already has some lensing. It's actually 10 sigma determination of lensing already in the temperature likelihood. So adding the, uh, the four-point function, so the um, determination we just presented here, goes from the black line here to the red line here, so that's the, the figure. So we're improving a little bit the determination of tau, and we're doing that by breaking the degeneracy between the overall amplitude of the, um, uh, of the perturbation and tau, as you know. Okay. Two other interesting results are for breaking the, cosmo uh, the geometrical de degeneracy. So again, Lensing breaks the geometrical degeneracy by bringing in more information on light <laughs> late-time uh, astrophysics. Um, so, well, essentially, we're improving by 3% the constraint, which you already got using, again, uh, Planck uh, with uh, WMA polarization and IL, which already falls in some lens information. Neutrino, this is uh, a bit more surprising. There is a small tension between what you get with uh, CMB alone and CMB plus CMB lensing. The reason for that is that because of the uh, rather low uh, large scale, 
the, it, uh, the uh, TT, the li uh, temperature likelihood wants a slightly higher lensing, 20% more uh, lensing, that's what the model will tell you, while our, our lensing determination here is a bit on the on the low side with a 6% less lensing that's expected, which brings you this tension. I'll go now, to I'll go now to quickly to uh, ISW. So ISW has a fractional uh, difference in temperature bring, uh, bring to the photons when they cross evolving uh, po uh, gravitational potential, which means that if you stack clusters or voids in the Planck data, you should see a slight excess in temperature, a slight decrease in temperature. And we kind of see that already uh, in Planck, but it's not very significant. Here. What's more interesting is the ISW lensing correlation, which has been uh, presented already by um <coughs> by Sabino, so I won't get into detail here, only to say that it's pretty robust uh, determination. You, you can do that by using three point, uh, measuring a three-point function with dedicated estimator, or you can do that by using a lensing map and correlating it with the uh, CMB uh, maps, and you get pretty uh, consistent result. You can also uh, measure ISW by correlating it with trace of large cloud structure. Again, this is pretty robust using different uh, estimator, different algorithm, different uh, foreground cleaning. And again, it's a 2.5 sigma determination, which is interesting, but not, not yet very, very strong. Speaking of uh, external tracers, there's some things that we can do also with lensing, and I'll, I'll finish with, with this because I think it's, it's one of the best use of the map I showed you before. Uh, here, we are correlating the map I showed you in the first slide with four different surveys, almost full sky surveys, of the large scale structure. And we've not spent much time trying to optimize the uh, model for each of those surveys yet we are easily finding very good agreement. Uh, we are essentially uh, expecting a, a course correlation of one when you rescale everything by, uh, by the correct model. And that's what you get for roughly for those four, uh, four um, surveys. So I think that's where the Planck map will really be a legacy and will really be interesting. There is a wealth of astrophysical information there by doing cross correlation between the Planck map, which maps dark matter as equal to, and different la uh, large scale structure surveys, which usually maps the uh, luminous matter. That's really interesting. I think, I hope, that we'll see a lot of paper dedicated to this kind of studies in much more detail than what we're doing here. Conclusion, so Planck trace is the uh, late dark matter distribution. You can show that by uh, looking at lensing or ISW lensing effect or ISW. I think there's a great potential for cross correlation with other surveys, just say that. Uh, where we go from there, we'll improve this lensing reconstruction. We'll use the full mission, so we'll get, we'll gain a little bit here, but the full mission will only gain us on the, the noise, on the data, but our uh, noise or bias here is essentially dominated by CMB autocorrelation, and that we'll, we'll never gain. I mean, that's, that's there, and that's it. So it's like a 20 to 30 percent improvement to gain here. We'll also try to use polarizations; they're going to be much, 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 much more tougher. But there's possibly a 15 sigma determination in TT cross T. The problem is that this one is very correlated. Hello, which is uh, TT TT. So th from that, there are also some potential for improving the ISW lensing cross correlation significance. That's pretty, uh, that's rather important because, as we uh, we seen with uh, Sabino, this is a, a foreground if you want for the FNL uh, determination. And uh, I think that in the future we'll see improvement of the f uh, well. I'm sure that in the future we'll see improvement on the, on the lensing at small scale from SPT and other ground-based and surface-based experiments. That's going to be very interesting because our determination at IL in Planck is not really very good for now, and we'd like to understand better what we're seeing in our data. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Karim. Did you work? Okay. Yes, it's great. Question over there. Can you say your name, please? Uh, wait, wait for the microphone. Um, I had a question regarding the... Your name, please, your uh, name. Matias Aldarriaga. So I wanted to know about uh, the prospects of getting uh, improvement at the low L in, the, in your measurements, because um, your, the anomaly in the temperature that's supposed to say that there's 10% less power or something at low L, 
he, this is an independent sample of high, low K modes that you're sensing. Th those error bars are not allowing you to do a 10% measurement at this point, but will Planck get better such, uh, th these kind of reconstructions that you can es eventually get a 10% measurement of the power at, at, at large scales there? Mm, not that much. <laughs> no, not that much. Well, I mean, it, yeah, it's, it's already amazing that we are, we are so uh, in so good agreement here because we're really dominated by those uh, those mean fields. I mean, we can further refine the mean field, so we, we're going to shrink a little bit this, this error, which accounts for error here, but not that much. More questions? One, two, three, go on. Let's thank again our speaker. And, uh,